Welcome to How to Commit Journalism, part of Capital Broadcasting's podcast network. I'm WRAL executive producer Ashley Talley. If you watch different television stations in different parts of the country, you'll see a variety of branding choices. Some go for the action title, right? Action 12, um, uh, live, local, late-breaking, sort of the the hard-edged, we're all over hard news, we're going to be covering the breaking news from every angle. Some go for a softer approach. Um, It might be on your side. I, I tend to see a lot of CBSs that have on your side branding. That's more of an advocacy sort of journalism, right? That is there to solve problems, Is brands itself as being on the viewer's side to get their questions answered and their problems solved. In some of those harder news rooms where I've worked in my career, there was something called the F word, and you didn't say the F word. And that F word, it's not what you're thinking. It was features. You all know what a feature story is. It's maybe a softer story or a story that focuses on people rather than government actions, funding deficits, crime rates, um, murder mystery. It's one that, that teases out the human elements of whatever the focus of the story is. So today I'm talking with WRAL longtime reporter Brian Mims, who I would say is one of those F-word reporters in a wonderful, wonderful way. Brian, you've been telling the story of coronavirus through a sort of different lens than many reporters are. Tell me about some of the people that that you have talked to during your past weeks of reporting on COVID-19 in North Carolina. Went up to Lake Gaston a few weeks ago and interviewed a nurse. She works at Wake Med as an emergency department nurse, and she had not seen her little boy in about a month. Little boy is five years old, and she had him stay at her mother's home just over the Virginia line near Lake Gaston. Keep him safe. She didn't want to be anywhere around him or her parents while she worked every day at the hospital. And then she wanted to be in quarantine. She was being very meticulous in her precautions. So she was in quarantine for 10 days after working a long stretch of the hospital. And then she went to go see her little boy. And it had been about a month since she dropped him off at her parents. So her mom, the nurse's mom, captured the reunion on camera. Her mom is an amateur photographer. So we saw this online. We saw it on Facebook, this picture of the nurse hugging her little boy for the first time in a month. And it was just so captivating. We we were all taken by this photo. I have chills just you talking about it right now. I remember it. I mean, yeah, it's, it's so emotion filled. Our, our social media editor found it and shared it with us. And we said, we need to tell a story about this picture, what led to this picture, who's behind it. So I went up. Um, the nurse said she, she hadn't had any experience with Zoom and her, her parents live in a very rural area with poor Internet connection and cell service. So I said, how about I, are you OK if I drive up there and interview you? She was fine with it. I figured if a nurse was comfortable with it, then you're going to be OK. We'll, yeah. we'll proceed. So that was that was truly a memorable story, the most uh, memorable, and I've done many recently. But when I was there, she she had to go back to work after the interview. So she spent two days with her little boy and then returned to Raleigh. So I had the farewell, which was just heart lacerating. I mean, just really, I was, I was in tears a little bit as a dad. I couldn't imagine having to say goodbye to my boys for a month or how, she didn't know how long she would be gone. What are some other ones? I remember you talking to the garbage man. I thought that was a, a good story. Cause we had this uh, sanitation worker down in Harnett County between here and Fayetteville who, who said, you know, we're having to be out there on the, on the front lines too. We're dealing with people's trash. And we're generating a whole bunch of trash nowadays since everybody's everybody's home. So there's a lot of there's a lot of garbage. And this, this one sanitation worker said, you should you should spotlight the sanitation workers, too. And he had a point because we had not really done that story. There's so many stories, but we've been focusing a lot on the healthcare workers. Deservedly so. They deserve 
all the salute we can give them. But I thought, well, here's something we had thought about this line of work. There are guys having to pick up other people's trash all day, and that's dangerous. So I went and interviewed this guy and his partner as they were going house to house, picking up trash, and they had some good points to make. There were people being careless with their trash, not putting things in bags and not really showing the respect that these sanitation workers need. You are really a different sort of reporter, I would say, in the WREL newsroom. Somebody will will get a story idea and somebody will say, oh, that's a mem story right there. What, what do you think differentiates your storytelling and reporting from a lot of, um, you know, what the rest of not just WREL, but other reporter, television reporters around the country do? I think a lot of it stems from my admiration in my early days for the likes of Charles Kuralt, Paul Harvey, some of the old time pioneers in broadcast news. They were really influential on me. And I grew up uh, mainly, I think I was 15, 16 years old when I knew this is what I wanted to do with my life. And I was an avid follower of Charles Kuralt. He was a CBS correspondent back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He was there for 37 years, I think. He had a segment called On the Road with Charles Kuralt, and he had a very folksy style, a gravelly voice, deep voice, wonderful writer. He was an elegant writer. He was often called the poet laureate of the common man. And I said, I want to do his job someday. I want to travel the country. I haven't quite made it to the national level of crisscrossing the United States telling feature pieces, but he did that for many years. And he is the one who really inspired me to get into storytelling. And I never really wanted to be just the facts, ma'am, kind of reporter. I've always wanted to go to a scene and really set it, set the scene, look for the, the details as one writer told me, always get the name of the dog. (laughs) Look for these fine details that can really animate your stories and bring them to life. I thought that I might go into print journalism. I wrote for a weekly newspaper when I was in high school. And and, uh, I I think of myself as a print person first. Uh, I'm a writer first and a broadcaster second. And that can be challenging in television news when You have to be concise when brevity is valued. So I struggle with that every day. But I I guess with my style, it's an appreciation for for the written word and making sure my video matches that written word as well. Because pictures in storytelling can be a distraction if not properly used. So I I want to make sure I'm obsessive about making sure I've got the video to support the words. And I I can see that that, how Charles Carell could be your, um, your influence that that makes a lot of sense. Now that you say that I have actually, and speaking of Paul Harvey, I've been going back recently and his son has an archive of all of his past, the rest of the stories online. And I've just been listening to him. They're so good. They're such rich storytelling, like you're saying in a very, you know, three, four minute clip. So, and I love the, always the surprise twist of those. Um, Having started in print, I started in print as well with a love of the written word, you know, with a love of what you can do just through words. You went to journalism school, right? You went to the University of South Carolina? I did. Yes. Uh, I I studied journalism and uh, English. I majored in journalism uh, at South Carolina. Was it difficult Think like if you already had that written word part, adding in the video part, like thinking of it that way. I'll confess something to you. Uh, writing has always been terribly difficult for me. I've always been a slow writer. I'm, I'm not sure who said it. Might have been Ernest Hemingway said, "Writing is easy. All you got to do is slit your wrist and let the blood flow," or something like that. Uh-huh. I'm, I may not be quoting him verbatim, but it, it can be very difficult. And it was encouraging to hear professional writers say, "Yes, I struggle and." to get the the words right to get the uh, to get the tone correct so i've i've just always struggled i guess it's a sense of 
being unsure of myself, what will people think? Will it have the intended effect? So I've always been self-conscious about writing. And I was always the last kid in class to finish the essay during a, a written exam. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe by going into television or broadcasting, maybe it would be easier for me because I wouldn't have to write as much. The stories are shorter. So I thought, okay, I'll give broadcasting a go. But the problem with broadcasting is that I had trouble keeping stories concise and I I would tend to overwrite and I still do that to this day. But I I think I've gotten a lot more confidence over the years in in writing and I've written some for Our State Magazine and a couple of other publications. And it's something I really want to devote myself to in the years ahead. But, uh, you know, I've gained more confidence. I just, I read voraciously. What do you read? I have a subscription to the uh, the Washington Post, and I love a lot of the columnists. The the columnists for the Washington Post, Kathleen Parker is is my favorite. She uh, she writes a twice a week column. I love her her style of writing, her wit. Leonard Pitts, uh, he's a writer for the Miami Herald. I read all of his columns. Um, I'm I'm big into column reading, and I would actually like to be a columnist someday. Don't say that too loudly around the television station. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm. Hey, I'm. I'm being fully transparent. I'm just thinking of things that that uh, I'm considering. I'm trying to figure out still what I want to be when I grow up at 46 years of age. Coming up in the next block, hear what Brian Mims thinks the F word is, not feature, as I have said. So you just a little bit ago, I think, described yourself as a feature reporter. In some Mm -hmm. places where I've worked, that was called the F word. (laughs) You know, some of those like breaking news, action news, whatever. They don't want features or they 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 say that they don't. How would you define features, first of all? And why do you think that's an important part of of television journalism? Well, I I think feature pieces are critical to a newscast, a news organization, because People need some redeeming story, some stories to inspire them, to, to make them feel good about their communities and their world. I think feature pieces are different. Feature pieces done well are different from fluff pieces. There are fluff pieces if fluff is the real F word in my book. <laughs> but a feature piece done well is so important to a newscast. We can't have all fast pace, hard news, no chasers. I also think you can bring the feature reporting techniques to general news reporting. I try to employ feature writing techniques to the top story of the day. It doesn't have to be all fact, 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 just the facts, man. Weave in some of those details I shared with you earlier. Let's talk about recently some of the hard news that you've covered. You covered a really tragic story about a murder-suicide of a family in the past month or so. How did yes. you... I mean, that was just horrible. Tell tell us a little bit about that story and how you approached it as you drove out there. This was in Montcure, a little community in Chatham County, about a half hour away from uh, Raleigh. And I went out there in hopes of interviewing family members. That's always something we're angling to do when we're covering a tragedy. Let me give you the details. The story was seven people were killed in a murder-suicide. A man shot two of his family members at a home across the road. Uh, And then he went to another home, shot his mother-in-law, and two people who were over for dinner. They had brought her a meal. She was 93 years old. Killed uh, his wife and then himself. And this all happened on a Sunday afternoon. I later learned that he had years of being a loose cannon, hot-tempered. He, the family members did tell me that he he's had violent episodes before and had threatened to kill people. And it some reason, for some reason, it came to a head that day, and he erupted in violence, uh, killed six people and himself. So 
that was a big story. Obviously, uh, tragic. It probably didn't get the attention it would otherwise have because of the coronavirus. Right, exactly. We were like, we were just totally focused on that. What in any other time would have been the lead story across every newscast. Oh no, no question about it, Ashley. And and I went out there, and um, it, it doesn't get easier. Never gets easier having to knock on the door of a loved one who just lost a wife, a sister, a son, whoever, in a tragedy like this. But it's something I do with as much tact as I can, as much compassion. I'll knock on the door and say, I'm Brian Mills with WREL, terribly sorry, because I truly am. It, it pains me to have to speak with people who are in this unimaginable grief. I've never experienced anything remotely like this. And do you do you approach the door with your camera in hand? No, I, n- n- no. Rarely do I do that, unless I'm, I'm trying to be aggressive with somebody who's done uh, been accused of wrongdoing. But usually, I go to the door without the camera, alone, and just say, "I'm sorry. I'm W R E L, and I would really uh, like to learn a little more, get some insight into." your loved one's life. Uh, I want to portray this person you lost in, in a very positive light. I don't want this uh, person to be known as just a victim, just a name, but this person had a life and a legacy and, and was dearly loved. And I want to convey that in the story. Can you help me do that uh, by sharing a little bit, a few details, maybe not on camera. Oftentimes they're not ready to speak on camera, but if I could just sit down with them and take some notes and share that information of the story, it's powerful. Even without the interview, it can be powerful. Yeah. And I have to say, I think a lot of young reporters take that tact, but Mm -hmm. you mean it. (laughs) I mean, it it seems like a very genuine, like you're genuinely trying to connect as a person to another person. It seems like that would, it's part of your, why you're good at what you do. Well, it, it, because I'm a, I'm a human being first, a uh, human being, father, husband first before I'm a reporter. That's something we all have in common. We are fellow human beings, and I don't want to just go there and exploit a tragedy. I, I have a genuine concern for, for, for these individuals. Uh, I've covered so many heart-wrenching stories over the years of young parents losing children. I have three boys, as I mentioned, and I I can really feel that pain. And I think, what would happen? How would I respond if this were to happen? Because it could happen to me. It could happen to any of us at any time. So going back to this Montcure scene, you know, you've you've knocked on the door, you've you've tried to talk to people. Um, I I remember another part of the story is that I think there was a young teenage boy that was hiding during the shooting as well in the house. And and I think you were able to uncover that information. When it comes time to um, write a script for television that you're then going to share with a manager who's going to read it, and then you're going to go on air with it. How, what's your approach there? What, what are you thinking from all that you've gathered throughout the day? What do you want to put on television? I, I'm looking for, for a narrative. Usually... When the story is breaking, when the facts are still coming in, I will keep it to just the facts, get the information out of there and not really concerned about forming a a narrative. As the day goes on, as the information is distilled and I have a a good grasp on what happened and I want to present the story on the evening news hours after it happened, then I'd look for that thread, that narrative thread to tie everything together. The way I told that story, and I think it made it more personal than, again, just a straight, hard-up news report. A woman approached me on the road and said, you need to know about these two people who died. These were the two individuals who were at the elderly woman's home. They had given her a meal. They stopped at her home every Sunday afternoon. That stood out to me so much that she drove to my news truck and said, I want you to see this picture of them. And I want you to understand and the people, your viewers, to know that these were good folks. They were like family to all of us. 
So she gave me that picture and that's how I opened the story. That made such an impression on me. I had a peg, I had a, a thread for the story. In the beginning of the piece was a little story about this couple. I always try to work toward the end, go full circle in a story generally end the same way I began. It gives me a, a roadmap in constructing the story. So that's how I presented it on, on the six o'clock news that day. Um, and I think it made it real personal. This I, I even wrote in the first person saying this, a woman stopped me and wanted to make sure we shared this picture with you and that you saw what kind of people these two were and what kind of people the 93, what kind of person the 93 year old woman was and how loving she was and the sense of kinship. And I think I, I think I conveyed that. Yeah, I think you did too. I remember that newscast. I remember that live shot or look live. And I think that is one thing that you're really good at. I know that we both have a lot of work ahead of us. I don't want to keep you too long today. As we end this podcast, what would you say to aspiring journalists who want to be storytellers and maybe think it's not possible being a television reporter? It, it can be challenging. I I wouldn't let the time constraints of television discourage you too much. And I, I've been there. There are times I, I could do three, four minute pieces, but have to compress them down to a minute and a half or two minutes. And it's a good discipline. It's good exercise for me to, to really weed out what doesn't have to be there. Television is, is still a very powerful medium. It's maybe not the most intimate medium because people are you know, watching TV and doing other things. They're multitasking when the news is on. But you know, my goal every day is to try to make people pay attention. It's not just another headline. There's a story to be told here. Remember to fall in love with the marriage of words and pictures. Make the pictures work for you employ techniques that you would in in writing to television. You don't have to abandon all of that. Look for the fine details, get pictures of the details, write to them. And it's amazing what kind of stories you can tell. To see and and hear some of Brian Mims' stories, head over to WREL.com and search Brian, that's B-R-Y-A-N, Mims, and you'll find all of his recent stories there. Thanks for listening to How to Commit Journalism, part of Capital Broadcasting's podcast network.